Schönen guten Morgen. Ich begrüße Sie herzlich im Namen der deutsch-belarussischen Gesellschaft und Morning, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you very warmly in the name of the German Belarusian Association. We've got a tight agenda. We're going to have a look in the re at the regions and talk about them this morning. And then we're going to make the attempt of having and drawing a full conclusion and what influence this has on the full country. The first part of our day will be dealing with the economy and um, we're going to be um, together with our moderator, Mr. Stefan Kiegebein, and his very interesting panelists. Hmm. <laughs> Stefan, we cannot hear you. Entschuldigung, ich war, ich, war, ich war gemutet. Das sind die kleinen, die kleinen Tücken des Technikalltags. Ich noch mal. Sorry, I was muted. These are the little tricky things of technology. Let me welcome you to the economic forum of the uh, Minsk Forum that will be opened by the ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany to Belarus, Mr. Manfred Huterer. Let me just emphasize that this economic forum also is the uh, Belarus panel of the business states um, that are being organized also in December with the European Commission, the uh, German um, Foreign Association, and um, we are welcoming you and we're also inviting you very warmly. And we're very happy that we're going to start with such a highly valued and um, interesting panel. The Ja, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, ich darf Sie ganz herzlich aus Minsk begrüßen. Ich hoffe natürlich sehr, dass wir uns nächstes Jahr hier wieder physisch treffen können und auf den großen Empfang, den wir im Anschluss an die Eröffnung immer organisieren, da freue ich mich jetzt schon jetzt. Ich glaube, wir hatten gestern einen starken Auftakt des Forums mit einer sehr intensiven Diskussion über die wirklich historischen Prozesse die momentan in Belarus ablaufen. Heute geht es, wie gesagt, um die Wirtschaft, ob es gelingt, die politische Krise, in der Belarus sich befindet, momentan zu lösen, wird erhebliche Auswirkungen auf die wirtschaftliche Prosperität von Belarus haben. Dies hat natürlich auch Konsequenzen für die und Investitionsbeziehungen des Landes zu Deutschland und der Europäischen Union. Klar ist dabei, und das, glaube ich, ist die Essenz auch des, der Panels von gestern, klar ist dabei, dass ohne ein Eingehen auf die Kernforderungen der EU, nämlich Freilassung der politischen Gefangenen, ein Stopp der Gewalt gegen friedliche Demonstranten und der Beginn eines Dialogs zwischen der Staatsmacht und der Gesellschaft mit anschließenden Neuwahlen, keine Normalisierung der Beziehungen zwischen Belarus und der EU möglich sein wird. Aus deutscher Perspektive kann ich unterstreichen, dass in den letzten Jahren neben dem zivilgesellschaftlichen Austausch gerade auch die Wirtschaftsbeziehungen eine der tragenden Säulen unserer Beziehungen waren. Unsere Handels- und Investitionsbeziehungen haben sich in den letzten Jahren trotz Rückgangs, trotz einer Delle seit dem letzten Jahr insgesamt, kann man sagen, generell positiv entwickelt. In Belarus sind über 300 Unternehmen mit deutscher Kapitalbeteiligung tätig. Ihr Engagement im Übrigen ist nachhaltig und langfristig orientiert. Diese Unternehmen, viele sind Mittelstand, mittelständische Unternehmen, diese Unternehmen sind nicht nach Belarus gekommen, um schnell das Geld zu machen und dann wieder zu gehen, sondern um zu bleiben. Unsere beiden Länder verbindet eine ganze Reihe wirtschaftlicher Gemeinsamkeiten. Dazu gehören eine Tradition, industrieller Produktion, eine Orientierung auf den Export und eine bemerkenswerte Arbeitsethik. Belarus geografische Lage, aber auch seine historische Tradition. Und ich glaube, das ist ganz besonders wichtig in diesem Zusammenhang, seine Tradition als Brücke zwischen Ost und West. Seine gute Infrastruktur und gut ausgebildete Fachkräfte sind gute Voraussetzungen für Belarus zu einem attraktiven Wirtschaftspartner 
zu werden. Und so könnte, könnte Deutschland als Technologiepartner in vielen Schlüsselbereichen von großer Bedeutung für die weitere Modernisierung, Entwicklung und Diversifizierung der belarussischen Wirtschaft sein. Конечно, существует достаточный потенциал для расширения сотрудничества. Это без сомнения относится к IT-сектору в наших странах. Я думаю, что Германии еще нужно многое наверстать в сфере дигитализации. Также это касается сотрудничества по поддержке малого и среднего бизнеса в Беларуси. И, конечно, Размышления о том, как нам и далее сокращать торговые барьеры, облегчать сотрудничество или как мы можем и далее улучшать инвестиционный климат для немецких предприятий в Беларуси и помогать белорусским предприятиям с потенциальными выходом на рынок Германии. Я думаю, что важной отправной точкой является повестка дня в области устойчивого развития на период до 2030 года она создала центральные ориентиры для международного сотрудничества, так и, да, так и для деятельности на государственном, региональном и местном уровне. Однако именно тема устойчивого развития и устойчивого экономического модели в Беларуси вызывает, конечно, некоторые критические вопросы к сегодняшней структуре белорусской экономики, которую вы сейчас обсудите. Слишком крупные государственные предприятия с слабой эффективностью, недостаточная социальная защищенность, слишком слабая инвестиционная безопасность, недостаточная поддержка частного сектора, особенно в условиях пандемии. Уважаемые дамы и господа, я перечислил все эти пункты, чтобы обозначить, чего можно было бы, было бы достигнуть при наличии необходимых политических предпосылок. Беларусь сегодня нуждается в политических изменениях и политическом транзите. Сейчас необходимо в среднесрочной перспективе разработать модели для такого перехода или идеи для честной и социальной справедливой трансформации. При этом нужно избегать ошибок прошлого. Олигархического капитализма, как в России, или шоковой терапии, чтобы люди в разочаровании не отвернулись от демократии и свободы, обращаясь опять к нелиберальным силам. Именно поэтому политическим силам, которые будут формировать новую Беларусь, понадобится экономическое пространство для социально ответственной и справедливой трансформации. Поэтому сейчас как важно создать широкомасштабную программу помощи со стороны ЕС мы вчера э, часто говорили в разных пенах об этом программу помощи со стороны ЕС, которая в случае политической трансформации поддерживает страну при отделении стоящих перед ней вызовов. Именно во, время, во время угрозы появления новых пропасти между Востоком и Западом нам нужен более интенсивный диалог, а не его ослабление. Основным, конечно, диалог между гражданскими обществами. Поэтому я считаю большой удачей существование Минского форума, который является идеальной лабораторией, а в этом году еще и своеобразным, можно сказать, цифровым мостом, для новых форм сотрудничества и диалога. Желаю вам трудотворной и увлекательной дискуссии. Большое вам спасибо. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your introduction, for your opening remarks, for your impulses. I guess you have set some very good points for our discussion, and I'm sure that uh, the one or the other speaker will 
take up your remarks and refer to it. So thank you very much yeah. for okay. your contribution. Um, now I would like to start our panel. And firstly, of course, would uh, warmly welcome our panelists who will join us today. Maybe I have a first round of introduction that you know who is speaking in the next uh, uh, 60 minutes. Uh, first, we have uh, Katerina Vanukova. She's the director of the Belarusian Research and Outreach Center. Uh, secondly, we have uh, Alexander Chubrik. He is the director of the IPM Research Center. Thirdly, we have uh, Robert Kirchner from the German economic team. Welcome, Robert. Then we have Indy Lovanov. He's the director uh, of the Center for Environmental Solutions. Welcome, Evgeny. And uh, Jeroen Willems, he's the deputy head of unit at the European Commission DG Near. Welcome, Jeroen. And we have two commentators, Stefan Hoffmann from North IT Group and Alex Alachnovich from Economic Advisor of the team of Ms. Uh, Tichanovskaya. Uh, um, so, welcome, everybody. Um, we will have uh, two um, separated or two, two different uh, rounds uh, of our panel discussion today. In the first round, we want to um, discuss a bit uh, the current status. We will focus on how the panelists assesses the current state of the Belarusian economy and which uh, internal and external factors have led to this state, to this current situation. And the second part, we will more focus on future aspects uh, on how the development could be in the next years. So uh, having said this, I would like to hand over first to Katerina Bonukova. Katerina, uh, so the floor is yours. Uh, maybe you can share us your view on the current situation uh, economic-wise in Belarus, please. Yes, thank you, Stefan. Uh, let me start with some back background since I'm the first one to speak. Uh, the Belarusian economy was stagnating for the last 10 years. And the stagnation's main reason is the lack of reforms, in particular in state-owned uh, sector. And of course, when uh, we had our economy hit by COVID, and Belarus is a small open economy, uh, it was clear that the consequences would be harsh. And uh, while the GDP did not contract as much as we expected it to contract, uh, we still, uh, the economy was still hit uh, significantly and uh, it uh, manifested itself in the deterioration of the financial state of the enterprises, first of all, state-owned enterprises, which had to keep up the output. Uh, and of course, uh, this resulted in in uh, financial losses and uh, financial losses translated in uh, increase in, uh, in debts of the state-owned enterprises. And this uh, created um, a huge potential for uh, financial crisis. Uh, and of course, afterwards, the August events came. And uh, the first uh, and major consequence is the a uh, break of trust towards the government, both from uh, population and the businesses alike. And uh, we all observe and analyze the immediate consequences of this. And the immediate consequence was, first of all, the uh, break, well, the collapse of trust to the banking system when people started withdrawing their deposits, converting their rubles into currencies, and uh, we see that the National Bank had to react quite drastically to that, uh, uh, introducing a liquidity constraints policy, which uh, um, is depressing for economic growth, let's put it the way it is. Uh, and uh, we also see the outflow of IT, but these are only, you know, uh, and of course this worries us. And another thing which is worrying us and the government as well is um, how to keep up the currency liquidity, how to finance uh, the international debts Belarus has. Uh, we have uh, over three billion to pay out next year in debt repayment and servicing. Uh, we only have 7.5 billion in reserves. Uh, so the question of um, where to get financing for, for repayment paying the debts would be the 
is the most um, uh, imminent question right now on the policy table, right? Uh, given that we do not have access to either international markets or to funding from international financial organizations from IMF, for example. But there are other things that, uh, you know, that follow from this, um, uh, well, first of all, break of trust and then continued repression uh, of uh, many, many citizens of Belarus. Uh, and I'm saying this as my uh, colleague, uh, one of the best economists in Belarus, uh, Dmitry Kruk is in jail for, you know, just being out in the street uh, on Sunday. Um, so, and these, uh, these consequences are obviously that given this lack of trust and lack of certainty, there will be no long-term investments. I mean, do not does not matter what we do right now with laws on investment regulation, whatever, you know, uh, international investment will not, foreign direct investment will not come to Belarus unless we resolve the current political situation. The same goes for, you know, for Belarusians, they will not invest long run. They will not venture into new businesses and enterprises. And all of this would have, you know, very important long run consequences. There are also no trust to, to the, even the best of policies, which right now the government is trying to introduce. Neither people nor businesses would respond to these policies accordingly because they do not trust in the best intentions. And uh, just to finish, right now, according to the polls, one third of the population has symptoms of uh, mild depression and 10 more percent have symptoms of uh, moderate or severe depression. And with this situation, with people depressed, the economy would also be depressed. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina, for your for your input. I guess the, the main issue is uh, the lack of, of trust and the uncertainties in, in, in the future. Um, I guess we can uh, focus more on that in the second part when we discuss uh, how to overcome this crisis or the situation and how to find, find ways out of it. Um, I would like now hand over to um, Alexandra, uh, Alexandra, Alexander Trubrik, sorry. Uh, so maybe you can you, you can add. Do, do you do you share the uh, uh, the view of Katarina? Um, maybe you can add the one or the other uh, perspective. Uh, what is your your assessment, your opinion about the situation? Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me to speak here. Uh, in fact, uh, I can follow to what Katya said uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, perception of uh, private sector, because uh, uh, we, uh, we are running monthly, like for the second month, we are running monthly surveys of uh, 100 plus uh, companies from the private sector of different size, and can monitor uh, business confidence and uh, well expectations of private companies in terms of their economic uh, status, financial status, production, demand, etc. And uh, we also have questions uh, about risks and about the perception of the main obstacles for uh, expansion of their companies. And what we can see uh, just in one month, uh, November comparing to October, uh, we observe uh, deterioration of expectations in all the sectors, uh, uh, industry, uh, construction, trade and services. Uh, in October, industry, I mean private sector, industrial private sector, felt more or less okay, but uh, and expectations were quite positive. But this month, all sectors demonstrate negative expectations, and we can say that based on this polls, uh, uh, private companies uh, are facing and expecting further uh, economic crisis. So this is quite important uh, because it is not only official figures, but also, well, overall mood say, in the private sector. Second important issue about this data, survey data, is uh, overall perception of risks of doing business in Belarus. And the perception of risks is uh, extremely high. So we have a uh, scale from one to five, where one very low risks, uh, five very high risks. And the average uh, score on this uh, question for, for the second month is uh, from 4.3 to, to 4.4, which means, uh, well, uh, very 
high or very high risks. And of course, uh, as Katya mentioned, uh, taking into account this high perception of risks, uh, you can hardly count on, uh, uh, well, any kind of expansion, uh, any kind of attraction of investments. Uh, also, we are asking about obstacles for uh, expansion of uh, economic activity of private companies. And uh, I should say that the key, uh, like top, top five obstacles are more or less the same uh, for the second month, and they include uh, very high uncertainty, almost 70% of companies mentioning uh, high uncertainty, more than 60% mentioned macroeconomic instability. And uh, it is quite important because uh, the National Bank, uh, well, put a lot of effort to stabilize the situation during the last five years. And uh, in fact, uh, in, in half a year, all these efforts were ruined, especially in the last couple months. Uh, so uh, microeconomic instability is once again in uh, top five of the obstacles. What was the, well, not surprising, but uh, it is really extraordinary situation where mistrust to the legal system is uh, in top five uh, in October and uh, November, it was like third and uh, top top third and top fourth uh, obstacle for uh, expansion of business. In fact, uh, due to the quite a low size of the well uh, number of uh, low number of companies, like one hundred and twenty five last uh, month. Uh, well, this is more or less the same uh, story. So financial. Problems uh, is another, uh, well, is the last thing that is top, top five. So you can see that we have the whole set of uh, obstacles for uh, doing business and can describe uh, the economic and political crisis because mistrust to legal system, like uh, number three obstacle or number four obstacle for doing business is really uh, something extraordinary because, uh, you know, you can compare this uh, situation to, for instance, BIPs surveys of the uh, IFC, World Bank, uh, EPRD, so this is like mutual survey. And uh, this, this this issue is not uh, in the uh, among the top obstacles for doing business at all. So it is in the bottom in the well, uh, most of all countries of the region, but now, this is really uh, the signs of very severe crisis. And the biggest problem is that, uh, as Katya mentioned again, uh, we have uh, political solutions of economic problems. Unfortunately, there is no economic, uh, good economic solutions or efficient enough economic solutions that can be applied now. Thank you. Uh... Alexander, for this uh, very interesting results of the surveys, but I guess it's a very good instrument to really see uh, what entrepreneurs are thinking, because they are very often the, the driver of driving forces of economic development and what they think, where they put their private money on. I guess they have a very uh, good uh, um, system where to put it or where to put it not. Thank you very much for this uh, for this insight. Uh, I would like to come now to uh, Robert Kirchner from the German economic team. Robert, uh, we heard something about uh, the efforts of the National Bank of, of Belarus. Uh, you and your team are not only experienced in con uh, high-ranking consultancy in, in Belarus with the National Bank and Ministry of Finance, but also in other countries of the Eastern Partnership. That means you have a sound background uh, on, the, on, on, on the procedures. Uh, what is uh, the assessment of the German economic team on the current situation? Uh, we would like to hear your uh, analysis, your, your views on the topic, please, Robert. Yes, um, thank you very much, um, Stefan, uh, dear participants. Um, uh, I would like to, to add a few observations on, on what uh, Katerina and Alexander um, said. And overall, I, of course, share their rather sober assessment of the current macroeconomic and uh, financial situation. It is difficult, for sure. Um, I think both due to internal and external factors and also both due to short-term and long-term factors. And currently we see that these kind of um, um, determinants overlap to some extent. And in the, on the long term, I mean, Katarina was absolutely right. Um, the, the last 10 years, I mean, we saw more or less a stagnation of, of, of GDP. That was different from uh, the early 2000 until the great financial crisis where 
there were at least um, steady income gains. Uh, the economy was growing in some years in double digit, double digit numbers. But that stopped at some point uh, after the global financial crisis. <clears throat> and and these, these gains were not delivered anymore. And now what we see is really um, a kind of um, economy that is not growing. So um, the, the reasons for that we discussed many years already also at the Minsk Forum. And I would say this state-centered model is, of course, the main uh, culprit. And it, it simply did not deliver and does not deliver anymore. <clears throat> In the short term, I think uh, what added to this um, to this already uh, bleak picture is uh, COVID um, in the beginning of the year, uh, the pandemic, um, which basically hit the country through external factors mainly. And here again, we see the high um, oil commodity dependency of the country, which is also, of course, um, part of the um, of the heritage. And then after August, there came this wave of political uncertainty related um, to the election results. Um, the current discussion regarding sanctions or um, the introduction of sanctions, but also the discussion regarding new waves of sanctions is, of course, something that only adds further to this uncertainty. And just the discussion itself is already influencing, of course, also business behavior and so on in a negative way. Um, Sector-wise, because that was also a question, um, we have also seen, I would say, worrying signs. Um, I, I just want to make two observations. One is on the IT sector. I'm sure that um, Stefan Hoffmann will say later more about it. But um, this was really, over the last couple of years, one of the main growth drivers of the economy, uh, contributing up to 8% of GDP, um, contributing a lot of export earnings. Um, and now we will there are question marks whether this success story will continue or whether there will be a reversal or a stop of these of these growth dynamics. And also in the banking se sector, that has been already said, over the last couple of years, we saw some encouraging signs. Um, um, Sasha mentioned that also. We saw some um, fight from the National Bank uh, towards a de-dollarization, towards decrease in a directed lending, and here we see also some new worrying signs that dollarization again is is is, is growing uh, due to the crisis. That also directed lending. That's what Katarina mentioned also to state on enterprises is on the uptake. Um, so some things that the national bank fought for many years, and it takes really a lot of time. You know they they can be lost overnight. Credibility is unfortunately gained uh, only through very very hard steps over a long time, but can be unfortunately lost um, very quickly. That's that's a very asymmetric, um, asymmetric nature here. So overall, I would say a bleak picture, which is further, um, is, 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 is even more dramatic because Belarus does not have strong buffers, um, whether it's the foreign exchange reserves, whether it's the fiscal situation. Belarus does not have a lot of resources to to weather such a shock, such a multiple shocks, and also international support, which could be, of course, um, could be an alternative to support the country, is in the current situation um, a very, very difficult to achieve. So overall, I would also just um, um, agree with my my two predecessors that that this current situation is very tense. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I guess it was a very good, uh, to all speakers, a very good uh, broad overview on the uh, overall uh, situation in the country. Um, unfortunately, not very optimistic for, for the moment, uh, um, what we all regret, I guess. Um, Yevgeny, I would like to come to you now, uh, tackling the, the topic of um, yeah, green business, green economy, recycling management. You are an expert on this uh, in this sector. Um, I remember that we talked last year at the Minsk Forum on um, this sector in, in Belarus, uh, having in mind that we will have the, the nuclear power plant uh, coming uh, is coming into, into operation and the, the perspective of all these uh, uh, connected topics. So maybe I would like to ask you to give an uh, assessment from your point of view about this sector. Uh, is there any... Um, 
some, some hopes when it comes to, to, to green business, to recycling management. Uh, what is the state of the art? If you give me, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, yeah, because I'm really uh, an environmental guy here in the panel, I guess my, my role is really to give us some observations regarding uh, environmental aspects and green economy. And uh, I will not repeat a lot of my colleagues about uh, general stars of uh, Russia, which really not very much optimistic. Uh, that, uh, in recent times, at least uh, before, uh, before beginning of this year, we really saw uh, opic trends uh, when it comes to uh, growing of public interest to environmental values, and uh, at least in Minsk and uh, big cities. And uh, from our perspective, it gave uh, it gave quite a serious background for uh, some green economy components development, and especially for small and medium sized business. And to start from some positive things, uh, uh, some defense, uh, at least in, in last year, uh, so um, some positive development in agriculture. Uh, in Belarus, we were uh, and got uh, more and more um, small farmers, small and medium sized farmers, I would say, who and they were very for uh, export to EU sharing economy um, components, uh, especially in transport, uh, bike sharing, uh, and some similar. <coughs> also, we um, see um, quite a positive development when it comes to uh, packaging industry and uh, development regarding uh, elimination of single-use uh, uh, plastic packaging, which already starting from January uh, next year in most of uh, uh, restaurants, cafes, and um, hotels, uh, single-use uh, plastic packaging and single-use uh, plastic dishes will be banned. So basically, Basically, there is a number of uh, positive stories, but uh, at the same time, on the other hand, I would say that environmental aspects and environmental protection uh, efforts are still being considered in general as an obstacle for uh, economic development. And of course, uh, we are very much worried that uh, as a country, uh, we are um, I would say we're quite late with uh, introducing of climate incentives into our uh, economic development and looking for uh, uh, developments uh, with European Green Deal. We're quite afraid that in, in coming few years we'll be achieving very uh, climate neutrality and requirements uh, into our economy. And then as the uh, aspect which I would uh, perhaps just touch a little bit now is the development of circular economy, which is, uh, I think, an important um, an important uh, priority for us. Uh, perhaps it's very difficult to uh, use uh, support for development, uh, it's, which we, we might really uh, try to prioritize. Uh, Evgeny, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Your, your uh, video you disappeared and the audio connection is uh, now broken. Maybe you try to restart your, your 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 settings and dial in again. So you are you're vanished now. I guess we, we will, we will okay. pr proceed with your own, but we will, we will take you for the second round uh, again. But we, we do not see anything right now currently. So maybe you restart your 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 settings. Okay. Um, um, thanks to all the speakers for now. Uh, uh, now we have last but not least uh, the view from Brussels. Uh, Jeroen Willems uh, from the uh, Director General for Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiations, better known as DGNIR, uh, from the European Commission. 
Um, so, Jeroen, maybe you can share some, um, yeah, the, the the view from from Brussels on the current situation, the the um, yeah reaction on the current situation, uh, and maybe you, you try to avoid a bit talk about the future since this would be uh, the topic for the second uh, half of the panel. So, please, Jeroen, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, Stefan, and um, yeah, that's the sadness of uh, virtual panels. You have suddenly panelists that uh, have a problem with their Wi-Fi uh, connection. Very interesting uh, presentations of uh, Katharina, Alexander, and Robert. And um, before zooming in on the EU response to the current situation in Belarus, let me say that I think uh, we broadly agree with the analysis of. Katerina, Alexander and Robert, when it comes to the structural weaknesses that exist for a very long time, and that as EU, we have been trying to work on with Belarus through our assistance, like twinning technical assistance. We've been working with the World Bank on a reforms roadmap, always, as we know, uh, using a gradual approach. And it was difficult to touch on the core issue of this state-owned enterprise reform, with stability being key. I was always told that it should be evolution, not revolution. Uh, and obviously, with uh, the current situation and the uncertainty that was mentioned by many, these modest reforms are not going to even move forward, um, nor could we actually provide support to that in the current circumstances. However, when it comes to the short-term situation, allow me to give a slightly different uh, perspective, um, because yes, it is true that uh, Belarus will face uh, some recession uh, this year, although the government still aims to receive uh, zero growth by the end of 2020. But if you compare the current macro picture, I'm talking numbers here, um, with what we see um, um, in the Eastern Partnership countries as a whole, actually, Belarus has been weathering the COVID storm reasonably well. Um, Ukraine is going to have 6.4% recession, Moldova 7.2%, Georgia 5.8%. I mean, Belarus is quite far away uh, from these type of numbers. Obviously, its response to COVID uh, was also somewhat different with virtually no lockdown, but it also could benefit from, uh, I think, a good harvest uh, this year, as well as the effect of discretionary fiscal policies ahead of the um, uh, presidential vote that uh, helped to boost domestic consumption. And also when it comes to the external financing pressure, I, I agree very much that on the longer term, this is going to be a major factor, but in the short term with this um, a famous loan coming from Russia of one and a half billion and uh, 1.4 billion borrowed in the market. Um, uh, there is no immediate, uh, let's say, uh, risks. And we can also see this, for instance, in admittedly very low forex reserves, but they have actually been increasing. Um, if we look at the latest numbers provided by the bank, uh, the national bank, uh, we've seen uh, uh, an, in an increase uh, as per the 1st of November. But obviously, and as all speakers have said, I think the key issue really is this longer term uh, structural issues of the underperforming, low efficient uh, state owned enterprises, which is many said is not new. I would like to just show you a nice uh, or explain to you a nice statistics um, when it comes to how this has impacted asset depletion in the country compared to other uh, countries in the Eastern Partnership. So in Ukraine, household wealth between 2000 and 2017 increased with 50%. Um, in um, uh, Moldova, it increased 6% times. In Belarus, it halved. So there is a real structural problem taking place, a bubble, if you want, that is going to burst at some point in time. And obviously, the current situation, with all the uncertainties, and indeed, 
absolutely no appetite for investment because what investors want is first and foremost some kind of certainty uh, is not uh, going to play favorably in the longer term. Now, when it comes to the response of the EU uh, to this situation, and let me try to zoom in and also a little bit on how that could affect the economic situation. Broadly, as you know, the response of the EU has been fivefold, uh, um, using a mix of uh, sticks and carrots. Now, when it comes to the sticks, the first and most visible one is the sanctions that we have put in place in two rounds, uh, including uh, in the second round to uh, Lukashenko and other high-ranking officials responsible for repression and intimidation of the peaceful demonstrators or the electoral fraud. Um, this will... This has symbolic value, but obviously has no real impact on the economy. This could change um, with the third package that we are preparing now, where we not only will target potentially um, individuals, but also possibly entities. As we're working on this now, obviously we cannot say much uh, on, on this topic. Second element has been to reach out our hand and to call out for a dialogue as a way out of the crisis. It's, in our view, the only way to find a sustainable solution. And it's indeed the only way to ensure that investors would come in. And this uh, impact on investment, I, I, I found it very interesting to hear the previous speakers. We've also seen indeed a net FDI inflow in the first half of the year, seeing melted away into an FDI outflow in the third quarter of, um, of, of this year. And also Fitch, as you may have seen, has reduced uh, its uh, rating or for outlook for Belarus for long-term foreign currency issues uh, from uh, stable to negative. And I think that's all clear signs that this need for dialogue is absolutely necessary to move towards longer-term sustainability. Third element is to really step up our support to civil society and the people of Belarus. So we have been there as from the start, providing support to the victims, to independent media, to digital outlets. As the situation is unfortunately protecting, protracting, we are going to announce very soon an additional package of support that includes uh, support to uh, civil society and media, to youth, um, to health, but also to SMEs. Um, because I think it is important that we keep working uh, with appropriate due diligence to make sure that we reach the right beneficiaries to support uh, SMEs in Belarus, uh, an area where the countries has a lot of potential. If you look at the uh, percentage of uh, contribution of SMEs to GDP, it's about half of uh, GDP. In Europe, it's 99, uh, it's 85%. So uh, plenty, plenty of scope for, for further uh, development there. At the same time, we are scaling down substantially our engagement with the Belarus authorities. So all these programs I mentioned at the beginning, the TIEX, the twinning, the technical assistance, um, unless they are in the EU offensive interest, for instance, in the area of nuclear safety, or when they are really supporting the people of Belarus, it would be a no-go and we cannot move forward. And that's not just for our grant assistance, but also for the uh, loans coming from EIB and EBRD. Um, so um, uh, that actually has quite some impact also on the broader financing needs um, of, uh, of the Belarus government moving uh, moving forward. Um, the fifth element, and that's already the forward-looking element, um, so we can talk a bit more, but not too much, because we are, we are advanced in the preparation, but not yet in the adoption, is that we are working on a comprehensive economic plan for a future democratic Belarus. So this is, let's say, at the moment, the broad response uh, of the EU, as well as our slightly dissonant view, uh, more on the here and now, but less on the um, where are we heading from now. Thank you, Jeroen, for your uh, um, input. I would suggest that in the second one, of course, the other speakers uh, should feel free to respond to each other, if you would like to. So you have a we have a light, lively kind of uh, discussion uh, uh, how it is possible under digital circumstances. 
before I would like to to go to the future questions, we received uh, one one question or remark uh, from the audience from the chat. So I encourage everybody to use this option and to post your questions or comments uh, to the chat. We try to bring up as much as possible uh, of these questions to the speakers. So I have one one question uh, regarding the sectors. Uh, I quote it now. According to official figures, the chemical industry is the second most important industry in Belarus after the IT sector. And the, uh, uh, the, the, the colleague asked for a feedback comment on this issue from, uh, from the speakers. So who feel ready to comment on this? If some. Which sector is the second largest after IT? Uh, he, he, he wrote uh, the chemical industry. Uh -huh. According to what he read is the chemical industry the second largest or the most important industry in Belarus after IT sector. Maybe you can give an insight what your your uh, numbers uh, uh, says about the sector importance. Well, in fact, it is quite strange that uh, IT sector is number one uh, sector in Belarus because it is probably number one in terms of the uh, speed of, uh, it was at least, it, in terms of speed of its expansion, but not in terms of its contribution to GDP. Of course, uh, but uh, it was growing very fast, and uh, well, I think based on the data on the second quarter of this year, the last available until recently, uh, IT services exports was almost uh, of total export uh, services in Belarus. So it is quite important sector in terms of chemical sector. Of course, it is important because. It includes uh, Belarus Kali, uh, which is a large uh, potash uh, producer, well, one of the largest in the world. So in this sense, uh, chemical industry is really important. But uh, in terms of uh, the value added, I should say is that uh, uh, if you compare, okay, Belarus Kali is a large company, but uh, uh, for instance, our dairy producers, uh, well, this Meal producers, dairy products producers, they are much more important in terms of, for instance, employment. Uh, our food uh, producers are more important than chemical products producers. Okay, thank you, Alexander. May maybe the, the, the colleague uh, meant that the IT sector was really uh, a gross. Uh, the one, the growth sector uh, in the previous years, maybe that was uh, mentioned. Um, I would like now to to go to our second round, um, having a look, uh, an outlook, or trying to to see what happens in the next uh, 12 months, maybe in the in the future. Um, Mr. Ambassador mentioned that uh, Germany uh, could be a very good innovation partner for Belarus. Uh, he mentioned the IT sphere, so we will come later on uh, to this topic. Uh, which could be a, um, a fruitful sphere and sector for cooperation. And, um, um, and of course, it's important, I guess, Mr. Ambassador, the support of uh, Belarusian SMEs to enter the German and the EU market, I guess, is very important to, to strengthen the bilateral um, relations. Um, in the discussion now, we, we uh, heard a lot of uh, um, uh, the topic of uh, the refinancing, the financing your own is a bit for the short term, a bit more optimistic than other speakers. Maybe Robert can uh, can take up this uh, this comment. Uh, how do you assess, Robert, uh, um, the refinancing, the financing options for the public sector and the large large state-owned companies in the next uh, year, in the next 12 months? Um, I would be curious to hear your assessment on this. Um, yes, may maybe let me just react briefly also to um, uh, to what Jaren said on the macro short term macro picture. Um, I would be a bit more cautious um, when looking at current data because I mean, obvious as a country didn't have all these lockdowns that were taken in other countries, and there are clear international um, comparisons. Oxford is uh, doing a kind of lockdown index where Belarus is really kind of outlier. And that had, of course, implications for the economic situation because simply they didn't close so many sectors. This is, is mirrored in the data, yes. On the other hand, the state-owned uh, enterprises, they kept on producing during the crisis. Um, and that is in the, in the GDP statistics, whether it's 
inventory or whether it's sold, it doesn't matter. It's GDP. And we have some indications that uh, some of these goods, they were not sold, but rather pile up on the, um, you know, on the courtyards. And, and this shows also that the financial situation of state-owned enterprises in general became more tense, that they run up more, more debt. Um, and, and so I would be a bit more uh, cautious on interpreting current situation. And also next year, I mean, we see in the whole region a recovery. Uh, for Belarus, for instance, the World Bank paints a very difficult picture for next year. So they see it more of a, of a continuation of the negative um, um, situation. So, so I would also in the short term be more on the cautious side. Um, in terms of um, refinancing, indeed, um, that's um, a tough question. Um, I would say there are two basic drains for reserves. One is the refinancing, yes. And the other thing is the um, population through the banking sector. So if they start to um, to, to ask for dollars, if they, um, if they uh, exchange rubles into dollars, then, I mean, the National Bank needs to react to some extent and intervene. Um, on the repayment side, I, my impression is that Russia is was always and still continues to be the ultimate lender of last resort. And I think this has not changed. And this was just obvious over the last couple of months when they uh, arranged some new loans. I would still argue that Russia has probably not an interest to, to, to stabilize Belarus on a sustainable manner. So they will always kind of um, keep them on a, on a tight leash. Um, and, and also the question is, what do they get in return? I mean, Russia has a certain agenda towards a Belarus, also in the economic sphere. And here um, the jury is out. What what will be you know um, what will be the the um, uh, that, that something that that Belarus might might need to give in return in order to continue to get this this refinancing. That's one thing. The other thing I think, which is much less uh, can be much less controlled, is um, this financial um, turbulence that may come and go. I mean, we have seen several waves. We have seen billions of interventions that were necessary to stabilize the situation. This is a risk factor that is really difficult to predict. I mean, we, we cannot say whether there is a new, you know, bout of, of uncertainty, which then might again force the National Bank to, um, to um, intervene and lose reserves, which are not that big and which is also something that, and, and Jerome said that rightly, rating agencies are concerned, change their outlook. So, so overall, the picture I would say is tense. I do not see a kind of immediate risk, but uh, overall it's, it's a, t a tense situation. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Katharina, you, you would be the, the next one anyhow I would ask to, to uh, jab in. So, uh, of course, uh, once to, um, with a comment of what uh, Jeroen said, of what Robert said, and maybe I, I add another question. Um, so, so far, the, uh, the um, foreign trade policy of Belarus was to, to have a, a third uh, part with, Russia, with the EU as a foreign trade uh, um, a volume, a third with Russia and the third with the rest of the world. So how do you um, um, see this for the future? What could be the, the future export markets for, for Belarus? Uh, is this having the third, third, third strategy? Is it appropriate or what do you think what could be the uh, uh, future strategy on that after your comments uh, on Robert, please. Yeah, I would just, I am um, very skeptical about this optimism on the Russian loan. Uh, yes, we have been promised 1.5 billion. We have received half a billion, but the very same day, basically the same day we received it, it was transferred back to Russia as a payment of uh, uh, debt for gas. So basically what happened is the exchange of private debt for gas into public debt. Uh, and we still have no news on the next payments. And yes, Russia will be keeping us on a very tight leash. And also I should note that Russia is not in a very good financial condition right now. And it cannot afford to finance Belarus in uh, such a way that Belarus can sustain the current level of uh, uh, of incomes, for example. Um, going to your question on trade, uh, Belarus has repeatedly um, uh, voiced desire to diversify away from Russia. Uh, actually, it's 40% uh, of uh, uh, trade which goes to Russia, of exports. Of 
Uh, and um, so far, these uh, efforts have been fruitless because, you know, to diversify, we need again to reform our economy. Uh, so um, unless, you know, some sanctions uh, essentially um, cancel out part of the trade with the European Union, I see no changes uh, in trade without uh, significant changes in how economy works. Thank you, Katerina. Um, um, Jeroen, I will just uh, come back to you. Um, um, you mentioned that uh, the EU is adapting the policy instruments toward, towards Belarus, um, and you mentioned some points uh, for closer and more intensified cooperation. Maybe you can uh, uh, have a look in the future to the next 12 months where, where you can see Uh, um, a more intensified cooperation. And I would like to add a question uh, from the chat. Maybe that is for Alice as well. Interesting for your comment. I'll quote the question now. What about the Marshall Plan for the EU West for Belarus? Um, Ms. Tiranoskaya mentioned the plan yesterday. Is it on its way? And do we have anybody in the, here in, on, on the panel uh, information on the timetable for implementation? And a question, could Ukraine be a blueprint for Western engagement? So, Jeroen, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks a lot. And um, uh, just responding to previous colleagues, in the end, I think we are saying the same thing, just slightly uh, from a different angle. I mean, I, I, it's obvious that um, there are these structural weaknesses. Um, at the same time, when it comes to Belarus repaying its debt, It has, uh, over the years, developed a really good and solid reputation of repaying uh, debt. It has always prioritized uh, public spending to allow uh, for debt to be repaid, but it doesn't mean that indeed this Titanic, which we know is moving towards a rock, the question is just when is it going to hit uh, that rock? And your guess is as good as mine uh, when it comes uh, to, to that particular question. Now, moving forward on the, the next 12 months, months um, is very difficult to say how our relation will be with Belarus because that will be essentially determined by Belarus uh, by by developments in Belarus itself so we have clearly Uh, given an indication on the one hand that we want to reduce our engagement with the government and enhance our engagement with the people, we are ready to increase our engagement with the government should it take the right measures and they have been spelled out very, very clearly. Um, moreover, and that links to the issue of this Marshall Plan, but we like to call it the Comprehensive Economic Plan for a Democratic Belarus, should there be a positive and democratic transition, um, then as an EU, we are ready to substantially, but really substantially step up uh, our support to the country. And this comprehensive economic plan is being uh, prepared and it's quite advanced. We hope to uh, have it uh, announced um, still this month, um, but um, um, yeah, until uh, it has been internally agreed, I cannot say so much about it other than the full spectrum, but really the full spectrum of all the instruments that the EU has at its disposal to support a, be a democratic Belarus will be used. Thank you very much, uh, Jeroen. Um, I would just uh, uh, take in uh, Alexander um, again. Um, so when we look uh, uh, into the future, um, of course, we talked about the, the, um, the state-owned, the big state-owned companies. You mentioned uh, uh, the SME sector, the private business. So what is your, your assessment? Which sectors are the most innovative? So we heard a lot of uh, uh, IT industry. Maybe Stefan will... Um, Give some insights or share their insights some as well later. But what are from your from your point of view, let's say the the, the three or four most promising sectors uh, of the Belarusian economy uh, when we when we thinking about private business and, and entrepreneurship? So what where are the the points of cooperation? Well. Uh... 
Every time when I hear this kind of question, what are the best sectors uh, here or there, uh, I, I feel myself quite uncomfortable because, you know, today uh, you see these sectors that are most promising tomorrow, the situation is uh, changing and, uh, well, we have different sectors. Of course, uh, we have uh, some sectors uh, of well, clusters of uh, companies, private companies, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in the food processing industry, uh, in uh, high-tech uh, producers of uh, different kinds of equipment, and uh, well, uh, even in the light industry, you can find very innovative and uh, well, fastly developing uh, uh, companies or clusters of uh, companies, but also services. So you know, everywhere where you have. Uh, well, developed private sector, you will see innovation and, uh, well, plenty of opportunities uh, for cooperation in the situation uh, when the current uh, political crisis will be re resolved. So uh, unless uh, it is resolved, uh, you can hardly talk uh, about uh, uh, any kind of uh, long-term opportunities of cooperation, unfortunately. But in terms of uh, state-owned enterprises, I think that it is quite important to uh, stress uh, once again that Belarus, uh, well, is no longer the economy where the state-owned uh, enterprise sector uh, is dominating. Uh, it is no longer the key employer in the economy. It is no longer the key exporter in the economy. So even in the industrial sector, it is uh, well stagnating or shrinking while the private sector is uh, growing. So, well, in, in this sense, it is uh, very important to realize that the private sector is, uh, first of all, it is now the core of the economy. Of course, it is the driver of the economy, the driver of employment. At least it was. <laughs> And I, I think it, it is, uh, if you look at the data of the first half of the year on employment in private sector and state-owned enterprise sector, you will see that private sector, even during the pandemic, during the first wave of pandemic, uh, well, uh, increased employment, while the state-owned enterprises fired people uh, So in the first half of this year. So it is also quite, uh, well, quite impressive uh, outcome. Uh, and it is not not only because the well absence of lockdown here in Belarus, but also due to the quite a high uh, well ad adaptiveness of the private sector and uh, its flexibility. Uh, so, and also, uh, if you think about further uh, actions, so what can be done here in terms of policies, in terms of overall understanding of the situation in Belarus. You should uh, take into account not only the current fast uh, changes in the society, very, very fast changes in the society, like formation of civil society, formation of nation, after all. Uh, you should take into account that these processes were quite uh, long-standing. And uh, for instance, if you compare Belarusians like 10 or 15 years ago and Belarusians now, you see uh, that uh, in terms of our relationship with the state, in terms of our relationship with the private sector, our attitudes toward market, toward, towards market economy, we change dramatically. For instance, uh, if you uh, look at the data of the most recent European value study, uh, you'll see that Belarusians are uh, at the third place in Europe after uh, Albania and uh, or, 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 Austria, I don't know, Denmark, I don't remember precisely, in terms of the share of population who thinks that the share of private sector should increase and state-owned uh, sector should decrease in the economy. So even Switzerland, uh, so we uh, surpass the Swiss Switzerland on the, so in this sense, we are absolutely ready to economic uh, transformation of the country. We are like grow up here, uh, this all this necessary, uh, approval of the private pro property of important. We are like uh, relying on ourselves, not on the state. So it is quite important changes in the society that uh, really uh, need to be 
appreciated by the state and really should be taken into account by any kind of uh, uh, reformers that will uh, do something to our economy in the future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alexander. So um, I just can, sorry for misusing my, my right of the moderator. I just, as a representative of a, of a business uh, association, I only can say that Companies, even mid-sized companies, of course, needs partner partners in the in the in the in the country, which are at a similar size somehow, which have a similar entrepreneurial thinking, and uh, that is, I guess, the the way where, uh, how companies and investors will come to a to a country. It's it's a, it's a kind of disbalance if you have a mid-sized company with I don't know thousand employees. And then a state-owned companies with tens of thousands of employees. So there will be just from a pure point of of a, of a mid-sized company, very very hard to have a corporation uh, um, having this very very uh, dispartial um, uh, partners. So that is what we can really uh, support to have more more private business that I was for, the foster for sure the the corporation. Uh, I have a question from the chat, uh, not specific to one uh, of the speakers. So uh, who would be able to take it? Please feel free to take it. Uh, I quote the question now. Where will there will be? Okay, that's a, a bit. Uh, the question is if there will be a state budgetary crisis in Belarus next year. So uh, some people, some of you mentioned that there will be a somehow a more or less stable situation. Some others are less, less optimistic. So the question, whoever will, uh, will take it, will there be a budgetary crisis next year in, in Belarus? So who wants to respond? Alexander, you're looking like... Well, you know, uh, the risks uh, are here, and, but, uh, well, uh, you can't be 100% sure that it will happen or it will not happen. Uh, it depends on the external shocks, of course. So if we have uh, external, additional external shocks to what we have now, the likelihood is higher. Uh, well, uh, no external shocks, uh, the likelihood is low. Uh, so it, it depends on many uh, aspects. Also, it depends on the, uh, well, the further monetary policy also. It depends on the, well, uh, overall uh, policies towards the private sector. So, uh, well, many factors that can deteriorate the situation and can provoke, uh, well, further risks of, uh, well, fiscal crisis uh, and sovereign debt crisis next year. But, uh, well, if you look at the most recent, uh, uh, well, rankings of, uh, uh, well, Fitch or uh, other companies, uh, well, they uh, remain the same uh, ranking, sovereign credit rank, and but only uh, deteriorate the forecast. Now it is negative instead of stable. That's it. So from their perspective, uh, in the absence of external shock, they have only negative forecast for development of ranking. And I think that it is quite... Uh, accurate, uh, well, assessment of the situation. Okay, thank you. Someone else was in reaction? Um, yeah, maybe just to add, um, I, I have a similar view. I mean, the question is how you define fiscal crisis. And um, if you uh, say this would be a default, then I would also say this is not the base case. And for the rating agencies, I think they, they factor in the ratings also the Russian support, right? Because, I mean, the majority of public debt is to official creditors, to Russia, to China. That's, I think, about 80 percent. And uh, so, so Belarus in the past has sh shown strong willingness to repay or that there were at least deals to refinance the debt. And I think this is also for next year the base case. Belarus will do, I think, uh, the most it can to, to continue um, this process. And if they then have to cut on other sites, on other expenditure, on industrial support, whatever that that may be, but then it's just it 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 adds to the difficult economic outlook, but it does not constitute a default. So, so my base case would be also that they are trying to to be on the on the same path as they as they went before, and follow a, a tight uh, um, fiscal policy. Um, so so that's but the challenges are there, of course. 
Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, can I? Yeah. It's just, yeah, yeah. Back, just the only, uh, well, right now, the Minister of Finance still has some savings from the good years in the past, which will help it cover some of the deficits this year and next year. So the only um, risk of fiscal um, deficit and fiscal crisis comes from the fact that uh, there is political pressure to, say, increase the state investment. And uh, if this risk realizes, then indeed the um, expenditure may increase so, so much that uh, we will be close to fiscal crisis. But on the other hand, we see no uh, realization of this policy yet only talks about it. Thanks a lot. So uh, I would now come to our two commentators. They had to wait more than an hour. Uh, so sorry for, uh, sorry for this long waiting time, but I guess we had to... Uh, a very interesting uh, discussion and now you are the ones who could uh, um, add your comments so you are the most free uh, in this discussion so maybe i uh, alice if you allow i would give the first the word first to stefan uh, uh, from north it group uh, and then uh, alice the floor um, is, is yours after stefan but now stefan uh, please share your comments your views uh, so one of the most free people here in the in the chat <laughs> Yeah, Stefan, thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation. Hello from Minsk. Um, I wrote down um, that Robert Kirchner quoted me and asked, uh, do you hear me? Yeah, you hear yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. um, about the development of the IT sector. Of course, uh, I have only a subject a point of view about the development of the IT sector. I speak with partners. I speak with uh, competitors, what, what they see. And uh, I would say for a short term, we don't feel any impact of the current situation. Uh, for for me, it's really 2021 is the year where we have the decision on the IT market. Uh, from internal talks to IT businessmen, lawyers, uh, a lot of developers just ask if they can deploy if they can go to uh, Lithuania, if they can go to Ukraine, to their offices. Some uh, SME IT companies opening now with one, two guys in Kiev, some office just as a backup. I see it like this. The IT sector in the last years were very hot here and uh, maybe they're using also this uh, political crisis as an opportunity to di uh, diversify. Uh, the real effect, uh, and I hope we will not have a brain drain, I really hope that, because I believe in Belarus. Uh, I hope that we will don't uh, face this next year, but uh, we will see. Um, if I am making a little bit uh, advertisement now, we have on sa Saturday a small IT event Uh, where we are, uh, where I will lead a panel discussion with some German funded IT companies. And we are talking about, uh, the next year, how we see the business. So if somebody is more interested into that, I invite you to join this event. Also, our co-host Ost Ostschuss uh, will be participating there. So uh, to have a more broad view on that. Uh, for me as a German, uh, we are. We like private, small, mid-sized business, and uh, it's nice to hear that uh, the Belarusians see uh, that uh, private business is good. And f also private business here in Belarus, in my point of view, stands for a development. And that's maybe we have such a good uh, point of view, not only IT, also other private companies. But like I said, uh, 2021 is for me the, the interesting year. So... My comments on that. Thank you, Stefan. Alles, now it's your turn. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you also to the organizers to make such a, uh, such an event. This is very important to discuss and uh, to share our uh, ideas between us. I will start from the um, overall um, Uh, my view on the on the future of the Belarusian economy in the short term, and then comment on some of the ideas uh, that um, other panelists uh, say, said before. So, um, in my opinion, this is obvious that if the current political uh, crisis in Belarus continues, then the and the authorities 
will still focuses, focus exclusively on the repressions as they did uh, for the last four months, then the economic crisis will be long and deep. Foreign investors, on the one hand, will not come to Belarus, but on the contrary, they will begin to withdraw capital from Belarus, which already started actually not in the second half of the year, but in the second quarter and third quarter. Altogether, they, uh, the outflow of FDI amounted to uh, $230 million uh, in these two quarters. Lack of confidence in the legal uh, and judicial system, something that um, Alexander Chubrik mentioned, dramatically reduces the uh, already modest private investment in the economy. Uh, due to closed economic, um, due to closed um, international financial markets, and uh, the freeze in cooperation with international financial institutions, something that Jerome Williams uh, mentioned about the EBRD and the European Investment Bank and the Euro Commission, uh, public investment will fall because they will not have enough resources to pay debts and to, uh, to help um, state-owned enterprises. Reduced government subsidies to the state-owned enterprises will make some of them insolvent and some of them will have to uh, bankrupt or uh, reduce significantly um, the salaries. Um, the authorities have already began to take revenge and to put pressure on private businesses that was not loyal uh, to the president during this uh, recent uh, election campaign and during uh, um, the protests. So some of Belarusians, but also businesses, will be forced to leave the country. So this is my um, opinion, how it will look like if the current political crisis remains. And you can also uh, see how, uh, how actually um, the regime um, reacts. It reacts with shifts in the government, in presidential administrations and in other organizations. Uh, um, people are shifted, people from the uh, military, from KGB, from uh, other um, special forces. So not the economy is the number one, but uh, remaining power is the, the, the ultimate goal. Now, I, I would like to, um, uh, to, uh, to come to um, certain points of, of our uh, general discussion. Uh, let me start maybe from uh, the His Excellency Ambassador. Um, you mentioned that um, repression should be stopped, and obviously this is not enough because uh, under the current, it's not enough to uh, to bring um, economic changes in Belarus because under the current political regime, already in the past uh, decade, uh, the economic growth already stopped. We experienced uh, at least three significant crises in the past decade. And uh, our perspective, e even without political crisis, was very low. And after this, uh, after the political crisis, our perspectives, uh, in the midterm at least, are uh, uh, the worst in the region. So um, uh, stopping the repressions is not enough. Um, let me uh, go to uh, some comments on uh, Giron. Uh, um, you said that um, Belarus uh, did reasonably, reasonably well under the COVID, and I agree with Ka uh, Katerina that uh, it, it happened because Belarus ignored the COVID crisis and the health of people, and also because inventories increased to the record high for the last five years. So uh, the GDP uh, was not uh, deteriorating so, so uh, deeply as it was in Poland, in Ukraine, in some other countries. But uh, the trade-off is um, the deterioration in financial results of uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, international, uh, you, you said also that international reserves have been increasing recently. But um, um, we need to, uh, to focus on this in more details. Uh, um, on the one hand, uh, the international foreign reserves uh, increased by only 165 million US dollars in the months when we received 500 uh, million dollars from Russia, from uh, Eurasian Fund for Stabilization and uh, for and Development. Right. So, without these half a billion uh, US dollars, the international reserves will uh, actually. Uh, 
be um, would be um, lower. And uh, it's even more important to see that um, currency reserves they went down in October, not significantly, but they went down. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the FDI outflow already started in second and, and in, in the third quarter they continued. Probably they will also continue in fourth quarter and uh, and later on. Um, um, there was solid reputation of Belarus uh, to pay that, and it's true that Belarus has already paid, paid uh, its debt. And uh, but many things changed this year, and it's um, we we cannot be sure that Belarus will have enough international reserves and external resources to serve the debt uh, in the medium term. Um, uh, now maybe I would um, comment on uh, on the on the uh, Robert uh, statement that Russia remains the lender of last resort. I disagree with this, and um, I also agree with Kat Katerina uh, that um, that um, Russia changed uh, the, the attitude to Belarus. If uh, until 2017, uh, Russia was always ready to support Belarus unconditionally, so that to give new money to serve the previous debts or to give new money to support the state-owned enterprises and so on, now it's, it's uh, no longer true, and now uh, all the money are conditional conditional on something, including political uh, transition in Belarus. Uh, and this is also why uh, the regime is trying to, to, to find some other options uh, um, to um, how to how to deal with um, with um, external resources. Um, Um, Alex, uh, Alexander Chubrik said that state-owned enterprises is no longer a dominant power, and uh, it's true. However, I think that if um, if the political crisis um, will not be solved, then the the, the, the pressure on private uh, business, political pressure, and also the deterioration of um, business climate in general in Belarus will bring the state-owned enterprises again the dominant power in Belarus. So this is a key. And we know that this uh, this sector, as in general, is less effective than the than, than private sector. Uh, so um, to sum up, um, I think that um, even without this political crisis, we have certain unfavorable conditions. From external side, these are tax maneuver, in uh, oil industry in Russia, every year we'll have to pay more for uh, Russian uh, oil. Uh, Belarus already pays uh, market price for gas, at least this year, first time in, in, the, in our history we pay uh, the market price for gas. Um, there are low demand and low prices for petroleum products and uh, potash fertilizers, so the Belarusian key um, um, export products, and uh, the midterm perspective is that uh, the prices would be at the similar level for, for the next few years. And we have also stagnation in Russia, our main uh, trading partner. And this is also rather a medium-term uh, perspective, not just short-term. So we have unfavorable external external conditions, but we also have unfavorable internal conditions including um, public debt problems, uh, state-owned enterprises inefficiency, but also demography problems. So given these, given these um, unfavorable conditions and given the political crisis, I'm uh, really, uh, I really see rather doom for the Belarusian economy. But it can be solved if the, if the political crisis changes and if Belarus, um, again, uh, improve the, the, the conditions for um, private business, if it gets uh, the support from the international society, international organizations, then the, the, our future might be much more brighter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Uh, so since we're approaching the end of, of our panel, and I do not want to overstretch the, 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 the time, I just want to um, start the closing round. 
uh, uh, so asking all panelists and commentators, and if you like, Ambassador, please feel free to, to add your comment as well. Uh, a question, uh, again, looking to the future next year, um, imagine we have Minsk from, maybe physically Minsk, let's see, uh, and we have the task to organize uh, um, an economic panel, maybe in a different setting, but an economic panel. So what would be the topic, the one topic you would like to discuss or you, you see what we discuss next year on the uh, economic panel of the Minsk Forum? Uh, so maybe I will start with uh, Yevgeny Lobanov and then ask all the speakers to add one topic, please. Uh, thank you very much, Stefan. I hope that now connection is uh, is better. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, I will be optimistic and I would say that in one year we would discuss a uh, transformation of the uh, Belarusian economy in a direction of green economy and how to uh, also cooperate with European Green Deal. That would be my message. Thank you. Then, Katarina, please. Katarina, are you with us? If you're talking, we don't hear you. Okay. Yeah, uh, I am here with you. Um, so I hope also that in a year we will be, you know, discussing in detail, uh, well, first of all, the reforms, what to do first, what to do next, and second of all, how to, uh, you know, how to protect uh, vulnerable groups in Belarus from the possible negative effects and, you know, how to uh, help transform the country into a vibrant, growing economy. Well, thank you. Thank you, Katya. Alexander, Chubik, please. Well, I hope that next year we will uh, discuss regional, uh, well, uh, local uh, governance uh, and uh, regional, like uh, territorial uh, also reform. So what to do in the regions with our regional uh, uh, development with our regional policies and uh, especially uh, with the experience that uh, our society obtained during the last uh, incomplete last year uh, experience in well uh, well in, in terms of uh, self-regulation uh, self-governance so i believe that now we are far more uh, prepared to the democratic mechanisms uh, of uh, decision making. Okay, thank you, Alexander. Then Robert. Yes, um, I mean, looking back at the previous 17 uh, sessions of the Minsk Forum, and uh, in some of them I had the honor also to participate, I think a safe bet is to say that next year we will talk about economic reforms as well. <laughs> um, my hope would be that we would um, move dis the discussion forward on, you know, some more implementation uh, effects, maybe some showcases already, maybe we can discuss already some lessons learned, some practical examples. That would be my personal hope for the next year. So not um, much more practicing and not so much theory. Uh, Jeroen, your wish or your, your expectation or your, yeah, your wish. Yeah, as um, people like to say, I can predict anything except the future. Um, what I hope is that this time next year, first of all, of course, we would be together in a physical format in Minsk um, and that we would discuss the details coming out of an IMF program that has just been uh, agreed with a democratically elected new government in the country backed up by substantial EU macro financial assistance. And we would discuss the overall economic transformation, uh, not just the green and digital, but the broader economic transformation that has been so much overdue and we would really would like to start with this when the conditions allow. Okay, Stefan, please. I guess, I, I, if I may one guess, your first hope I guess is that you're still running your business in Minsk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this would be, uh, I, I'd say the normal case, but uh, I would like to, uh, to lead a matchmaking event in the surrounding of the uh, Minsk Forum which brings uh, SME companies from Europe and Belarus together. That is a good proposal for the organizers. So they're on the line and hopefully they, they heard it. 
Uh, Alice, you are the next one, please. Yeah, I, I think that we already mentioned it. So I hope we will meet in person in Minsk, uh, even more of us, uh, and we will discuss the booming private initiatives in Belarus and um, the, the huge international cooperation with Belarus and also uh, the first successes of economic reforms in Belarus. Thank you very much. And Mr. Ambassador, you opened the panel and now you have the, we, we see you, we see you, and now you have the honor to, to close the panel, please. Yeah, thank you very much for this highly interesting panel. I hope that we have all seen what is going on in the country in the context of the crisis. We have learned what challenges the country has. Of course, I hope that we are going to physically meet again next year here in Minsk. You also asked which topics we will raise and discuss next year. I really hope that we will talk about transformation-related issues in many different contexts regarding many different aspects. It's not just about privatization. It's not just about marketization. I mean, these are very important factors, of course. But I do think that next year we will have another topic that needs to be urgently discussed. It is social justice. Please take a look at the history of transformation in post-Soviet countries. You will then see that often, and this also includes Russia, we at the beginning of the 1990s had economic concepts that looked pretty good on paper, but when it came to their implementation, it turned out that many things were tricky and difficult. Let me remind you of Yavlinsky's great idea of rent bargain, etc. And this rather disappointing development in Russia at the beginning of the 1990s in terms of the introduction of the market economy should be a lesson for all of us. In other words, we need to make sure that we develop ideas already now. And this, of course, is also a task for economic experts, economic scientists. So how can concepts be developed to make sure that the transformation, which is absolutely necessary and indispensable and of utmost importance for the future of the country, can be socially designed in a way that the entire population is taken on board. And we have to make sure that certain parts of society do not turn away from reforms and turn to illiberal forces. It seems to me that this is a crucial task of and for the forum in 2021. Thank you very much. It was an excellent debate. Thank you very much, Mr. Huterra. This exactly was a question in the chat that appeared lately, a question on uh, um, alternatives and uh, forms of transformation and uh, the, the approaches between private and public. So thank you very much that, that you touched uh, this topic in your, in your uh, um, closing remarks. I would like to thank all the participants today. I just uh, uh, thank you, uh, Yevgeny Lobanov, uh, Katrina Bonukova, Alexander Chubrik. Thank you very much, Robert Kirchner, Jeroen Willems, Stefan Hoffmann, Alex Alachnovich, sorry, and of course, uh, Ambassador Manfred Hutera, in Minsk. So thank you very much for the lively discussion. Um, if someone uh, felt not be, um, uh, not, not be, um, uh, or the questions should not be answered, answered what, what we saw from the chat. So please share uh, the questions again and address it to one of the speakers. I guess we can forward them to, to the speakers so that you are in, or have the chance to be in, in direct contact with the speakers. So use this chance and, and uh, share your, your, your questions if you couldn't make it in, in the chat. So for now, I thank you and would like to hand over to the moderators of the whole day, please. The Minsk Forum Studio, as I see here in Zoom. 
Und ich habe eigentlich nur noch das Vergnügen, Sie in die Mittagspause zu entlassen. All I can do is tell you that we are now breaking for lunch. We're going to continue at 12 p.m. Then we will shed light on the different regions in Belarus. Please recharge your batteries because then we will have two panels without a break. So enjoy your lunch break. Thank you.